Amen. Thank you for that. And we're so thankful for the volunteers. Thank you, Greg, that are going to teach our kids' own kids and the nursery workers, uh, systematically teaching our kids the Bible week in and week, week out. So thankful for them. Also thankful for uh, the guys who mowed the church lawn all summer long. So thankful for them. They volunteer their time to do that. Yeah. So uh, grateful for them. And uh, this morning we're going to talk about if you had 36 days to live. Man, we're down to 36. If you had 36 days to live, what would you make time for? Don't have time for everything, but what would you make time for if you had 36 days to live? That's what we're going to talk about today as we work through the book of Ecclesiastes. So we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 now, so if you have your Bibles with you and you'd like to open them with me, you can do that, Ecclesiastes and chapter 9. There are also Bibles in the back on that cart if you would like one. Before I read, I would like to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are your people and you are our God. You are the king and we are your kids. So Lord, I pray that you would come and do your work in our hearts for your glory and our good. Lord, uh, I, I ask that you would stand in front of me while I'm in front of them and that you would talk over me while I talk to them. Do this for your glory and our sakes. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm kind of approaching this from the idea that I think the author of the Ecclesiastes is really trying to break down our idols, uh, the stuff that we value more than God, so that we can enjoy life so that we can enjoy God. Because when we are looking at the wrong, th wrong things for uh, more fulfillment or more joy than they can offer, we are setting ourselves up for frustration and anger. I, I, I'm just saying, I think a lot of us are frustrated and angry because we expect too much of the wrong things. Let me show you that kind of as we go. So Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 1. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. God is in charge of all of it. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. God is in charge, and we are really, really not. It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked. So what is the same event that he's talking about? Death, yes. The same event, death, happens to everybody, to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner. And he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil or a disaster in all that is done under heaven, un under the sun, sorry, that the same event happens to all. Everybody dies. doesn't matter if you are righteous or if you are wicked, if you are good or evil, clean or unclean. Everybody dies and nobody knows when. That's his point. Hey, some of you work around this stuff. And I think the closer you are to it, the more you'd say that's true. Like it, no one really knows. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil or disaster or pain and madness is in their hearts while they live and after that they go to the dead. But he who is joined with all the living has hope for a living dog is better than a dead lion. In other words, now is the chance. While you're alive, now is your chance. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished. And forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. They die and they're dead. And this is your chance. This is the chance that you have. So go 
Eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments always be white. Let not oil be lacking from your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. He gives three reasons why you should give yourself to grateful joy now. And the first reason is that we are all going to die. So it's kind of like what he's been doing is breaking down our idols, breaking down the things that we love, that we value more than God. Maybe one of those would be denial of the fact that you are going to die. A lot of us would think, I just, I just never think about it. I mean, he's like, well, you need to think about it. You are going to die. So it's like him taking our denial of the fact that we're going to die, and when he does... I really thought it was going to break. <laughs> I did not know I had an indestructible cup. <laughs> I mean, I usually test stuff. I thought, I don't need to test a glass cup. It will break. <laughs> well, there goes that illustration. <laughs> so you just have to pretend it broke. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So he's trying to break <laughs> the idea that we can live in denial of the fact that we're going to die. And you're going to die. It's kind of like if you go to the Allegan County Fair and you take, you take a kid to the Allegan County Fair and you're like, this is going to be a great time. You're going to have a lot of fun. And you take a kid to the Algonquin County Fair, fair, you pay the whatever the entrance fee is, and then you buy them the bracelet so they can they can ride all the rides. And you're like, we've got we've got two hours. We're gonna ride all the rides we can ride for two hours. And the next time you look over at the kid, you see him sitting on a bench, <laughs> just kind of doing this. And you're like, bro, we don't have forever. Like this is your chance. And so they ride a ride, and then the next time you see him, he's sitting on the thing doing this. And you're like, come on, man, this is your chance. This is what the author of Ecclesiastes is saying to you. This is your chance. This is your chance. Take your chance. Stop living in denial that your time will end. Your time will end. This is your chance. Then, the next thing he attempts to break <laughs> is in verse 11. Again, I saw under the sun, the race is not to the swift. Okay, well then, who wins the race? If it's not to the swift, who wins? But his point here is that life doesn't always go how you think it's going to go. So you think, well, of course, of course I'm in control. Of course I can win because I'm swift. He's like, life doesn't always go how you think it's going to go. He says, nor the battle to the strong. The strong don't always win because life doesn't always go how you think it's going to go. No bread to the wise because life doesn't always go how you think it's going to go. Nor riches to the intelligent because life doesn't always go how you think it's going to go. Nor favor to those with knowledge because life doesn't always go how you think it's going to go. But time and chance happen to them all. Like, it doesn't always work how you think it's going to work. For man does not know his time like fish that are taken in an evil net. So think of the fish, think of Nemo swimming along, <laughs> right? And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's a net. Zoot. And the fish is like, what just happened? Man, how many times in life has that been you or has that been me? Like we're just kind of minding our own business, swimming along, and there's a net, and we're taken by it. He says, that's how life is. We're like fish that are taken in an evil net or like birds 
that are caught in a snare. There's a bird just kind of sitting there, minding its own business, and then it's caught. So the children of men are snared in an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. I'm kind of afraid to try this again, but I'm going to try it again. This is what he's saying. He's saying, you're hiding behind the idea that you're in control. And so what you're trying to do is saying, well, I'll have time for grateful joy and worship. I'll worship God later on after I've built a big enough pile. But right now, I don't want to lose my edge. Right now, I think I'm in control because I think the race is to the swift or riches are to the wise or bread. Like, I think I can understand how life is going. I think everything is under control. So I am just going to be in charge of my life and I will take time to worship God and have grateful joy later on. And he's saying, you are not in control. Man. Nearly in this one. Oh. You're not in control. Well, the ground is bouncy too. <laughs> yeah, I should have brought a hammer. I just didn't want to get it in my face. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm not in control. Thank you. This is perfect. I am not in control. The illustration is more true than I had realized. <laughs> I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me that there is a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege work against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered that city. So you imagine this little city, and there is a poor wise man in it, a great king comes around, surrounds the city, he's going to destroy the city, take everything they own, There's there's a wise man that outwits them and saves them. And he says, no one remembered that poor man. So the third, I'm not even going to try this time, the third idol he's trying to help us get rid of is the idea that I'll wait and I'll have grateful joy, I'll worship, I'll give my heart to God, and I'll have joy after I've built a big enough pile that I'll be remembered forever. After they build a couple monuments to me, then I will take time for grateful joy. And he's saying, that is wrong. No one will remember you. So this is a picture we took uh, several years back now. You can see, of course, that's me. That is my son, Caleb. That is my dad. That is my grandma. And that is my great-grandma. So five generations in that picture. And uh, what are the chances that Caleb remembers great-great-grandma? He will only remember the stories we tell about her. And he's in the picture with her. Here's the thing. You can live into your 90s, but that is no guarantee that you will be remembered. So do not tell yourself, I will have time to worship, or I will have time for joy. I will have time for gratitude later on after I built a big enough pile. Do not tell yourself that. Because you will be forgotten. So the author is trying to break things so that he can build things. This is part of what he's building. Our room for helping us understand and find joy in God's gifts. So the first gift I'd want to talk about with you is the gift of the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus has reached rock star status in Matthew chapter 2. So this is not going to come from Ecclesiastes chapter 9, but it will come from a big view of the whole Bible, and then we'll come back to Ecclesiastes chapter 9 at the end. So Jesus has reached rock star status because he has healed the sick, he has made the lame walk, he has uh, given sight to the blind, he has helped the deaf here, like Jesus has been doing all these healings, and it is just like crowds, massive crowds are following him around. So he's in this house in Capernaum, 
and he is in there, and the paparazzi and everyone are surrounding him, and they're trying to get to him, and there's no way they can get to him. So they get their, their buddy who can't walk. Uh, he's bedridden, and they climb up on the roof of the house, and they make a hole in the roof of the house, and they let their buddy down in front of Jesus, and Jesus sees their faith. He sees how their beliefs led them to action, the strange, socially awkward act of cutting a hole in their friend's roof and letting a guy down in front of Jesus. So Jesus sees this, and what do you think he's going to say to the paralytic? After, listen, because some of you know the story, so it's not going to work for you. But after they've seen him give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, heal the sick, what are they expecting? They're expecting him to say, rise up and walk. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because the forgiveness of sins is the best gift. In fact, it is the only gift that matters until you have it. So imagine, imagine a father buying an incredibly expensive gift for his daughter, but then being mad at her and holding a grudge against her and not speaking with her and criticizing her and all these things. Would you rather have forgiveness and joy in the relationship or would you rather have the expensive gift? I think you'd rather have both, but you'd want to start with forgiveness and joy in the relationship. I mean, imagine a spouse taking an, the other spouse on a dream vacation and traveling the world together, but never speaking to them, only being bitter with them, only being critical of them. Well, I mean, which one would you rather have? Would you rather have the dream vacation, or would you rather be on good terms with your spouse? I think you'd want both, but first, you'd want, you'd want forgiveness. Imagine kids actually remembering their parents' anniversary and actually celebrating their parents' anniversary. I mean, would you rather have that, or would you rather have them talk to you and be happy and, and love you? Like, so, so here's what I'm saying. I'm saying for, everything starts with forgiveness of sin. And we've all sinned, and where we need to start is with the forgiveness of sin. Once you have the forgiveness of sin, then God offers, and again, I'm talking about the whole Bible now, rather than just Ecclesiastes chapter 9, then you have resurrection hope. And for some of us, I think resurrection hope is not all that attractive because we don't understand it. So in this picture, <laughs> can you see that? There's a dude with wings and a halo sitting on a cloud, and he write, and it's written there by the far side, I wish I'd brought a magazine. I saw another one just like that, and the caption was, Heaven is hell for creatives. It's kind of how we think of heaven, which is wrong. I mean, it's dead wrong. Jesus, well, before we get to that, you know the early church feasted quite often? So in Jude, we read, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear. So Jude is writing to this body of believers that has been infected by false teachers. And these false teachers are using and abusing them and so he's saying these guys are like hidden reefs that a boat would go along and then hit, and you never saw it coming. Um, you've maybe met people like that. And, but, but the point I want you to see here is they're having love feasts. I can show you several different examples in the New Testament of the early church feasting. You know why the early church feasted? Because it was a picture of heaven. Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. He's like, here's what heaven is going to be like. Heaven is going to be like this fantastic feast. It points forward to Revelation chapter 19 of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Heaven will, will not be this boring place where you sit on a cloud and wish you brought a magazine. Heaven will be more like a fantastic feast. So, in the, in the book that we handed out at the beginning of this series, uh, chapter 7, which is your reading for this week if you're keeping up, 
David Gibson writes, those without Christ often abandon themselves to eating and drinking, okay? So they abandon themselves to eating and drinking because they think that's all there is in life. Because sometimes it looks as if that's all there is to do before we die. So you might as well eat and drink because what else are you going to do? I mean, that's all we have. But those who love Christ cherish eating and drinking because it looks a little like what we will do after we die. You see that? Heaven is more like a feast. The gifts are from the real country. They smell and taste and feel like home. So back in the beginning of this series, we handed out the book, Living Backwards, and we handed out a bookmark with the book, and we put your homework for this week, which we talked about a little about last week, and it, it's right here. It says, homework, with loved ones, enjoy a meal that reminds you of your heavenly home. You do this in resurrection hope. You do this because this will be like what you will enjoy someday in heaven. So last week we talked about how enjoy this meal, not in a hurry, because you're looking forward to the day when there will be no more hurry. Enjoy this meal without your phones because you're trusting the one who knows everything so you don't have to know everything in that moment. And enjoy this meal taking turns giving thanks to our Lord because that is where joy comes from. Okay, so the first gift is forgiveness of sins. Second gift, resurrection hope. Third gift is back to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. God gives us gifts to enjoy now. Just don't expect too much of these gifts. So, this is a picture of my first truck, uh, my first car, really. It was a Dodge D50, 1980. Um, fantastic little vehicle, as long as you don't need to go faster than 53 miles an hour. <laughs> it was a fantastic vehicle, as long as you don't need to go uphill in the wintertime. <laughs> uh, it it um, had a flatbed. You can see the flatbed on it, and... Of course, I didn't have the four-wheel drive on all the time, so it was just real, real drive, and there was just zero weight in the back end, and I'm not kidding. Like, I learned how to drive. I turned 16 in uh, February, and we lived in the UP, and the plow trucks could not keep up, and there were times I couldn't make it up a hill. I'd have to go back and go around a different way until I figured out to put weight in the back end. That helped quite a lot, but it was still a scary vehicle in the winter. Great truck, as long as you're not trying to pit, fit your family of five in it. Won't work for that. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying you can enjoy gifts like that truck as long as you have the right expectations for them. This is really part of what Ecclesiastes has helped us with. Enjoy life, just have the right expectations for life. If you expect life to be totally under your control, to always go how you think it's going to go, to always work out the, th the way you think it's going to work out, you're going to be constantly frustrated. You're going to be constantly angry. So just and look up and give thanks for the gifts that God gives. This is what 9, 7 through 10 says. So he says this time, this is the last time he's going to say this in the book. He says, go. So before he's just said there's nothing better, this time it's like take application here, go and do it. Go, eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart for God has already approved what you do. He's saying go and enjoy your dinner. Just don't expect dinner to heal the wounds of your childhood. Just don't try to make dinner of eternal value. That's placing too high of expectations for dinner. If you just enjoy your dinner and look up and say thank you for it, you'll be able to enjoy it while you give glory to God. Then he says, always wear white. Clothes are great. Wear nice clothes. Just don't expect clothes to cover your shame. Just don't expect clothes to... Make your past go away and hide your past. I mean, just there, there are things that clothes can do and there are things that clothes really can't do. So just enjoy your clothes. Just look up and say thank you for them. 
He says, always have oil on your head. Like, enjoy the nicer things. Just don't expect them to make you a nicer person. Just don't expect valuable things to make you more valuable as a person. There's things that they can't do. So just enjoy them and look up and say thank you for them. But they're, n- they're not going to give you eternal worth or value. You already have that because you're a child of God. Have these things, but don't expect too much of them. He says, love, love your wife. Enjoy the life with the wife of your, whom you love. Like, in, enjoy her. Love her. Love your spouse. Just don't expect her or don't expect him to heal all your past hurts, all your past hang-ups, and all your habits. They can't do that. They can't. They can't help you deal with your insecurities. They can't fix all your fears. They can't fix all your discontentments. They can't do that. This is... This is your spouse, though. Love them. Love them by not expecting too much of them. Love them by looking up and saying thank you for them. Love your work. He says, enjoy your toil. Work hard. This is the time you have. Work is good. I mean, it was created before the fall. It, it's very good. It's something to give your whole heart to. Work hard. Just don't expect people to build monuments to you. Don't expect to be remembered forever for what you've done. Just don't expect too much of it. So thankfully enjoy all God's gifts in eternal hope because you've already received the forgiveness of sin. So this week, if you had 36 days to live, what would you make time for? I hope you'd make time to investigate Jesus' claims about the forgiveness of sin. If you haven't got that figured out, that's the first thing to figure out. I hope you'd make time to understand resurrection hope. Because that will take the pressure off life now, knowing that there is a life to come. And I hope you take time to enjoy God's gifts now, after all he gave them to you, for you to enjoy. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for joy, for the forgiveness of sins, for resurrection hope. Lord, I thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen.